right bracket chapter 10. The tithe is the Lord's. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Lev. 27 30. Tithing was not a new law introduced by Moses, for it existed in the days of the patriarchs even from the beginning of time. These tithes came from the annual increase of crops, herds, etc. See Jude.14 22. Some of this 10% was for the assistance of the poor, the fatherless, and widows, also to sustain the Levites, whose full time was devoted to administering the ordinances of the Lord. See Jude. 14.29. There is an important scripture indicating the close relationship between tithing and the law of consecration, and showing that they were both being practiced in the time of Abraham. From the inspired translation of the Bible we read, Wherefore, Abram paid unto him, Melchizedek, tithes of all that he had, of all the riches which he possessed, which God had given him more than that which he had need, surplus. And it came to pass, that God blessed Abram, and gave unto him riches, and honour, and lands for an everlasting possession, inheritance. According to the covenant, consecration, which he right bracket had made, and according to the blessing wherewith Melchizedek had blessed him, stewardship. Gen. 1439-40. Thus, the principles of tithing, surplus, inheritances, consecration and stewardships were all in vogue at the time of Father Abraham. It will be discovered that both the laws of tithing and consecration are companions both eternal and everlasting principles that are never to be done away. One does not substitute or supplant the other. A good example of the close relationship of these two laws can be found in the Book of Mormon. When the Saviour appeared to the Nephites after his resurrection, he commanded them to obey the statute of tithing, which he quoted from the prophet Malachi. For I am the Lord, I change not bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. 3, Nephi 24 6, 10. But then we read that on the very next day they did minister one to another semicolon and they had all things common among them. 3 Nephi 26 19, did they reject the law of tithing that the Lord had just given them and then during the night set up a united order? Why did the Lord give this law of tithing to them, and say that it would be also for future generations, if they were going to abandon it the next day? It is another proof that both tithing and right bracket consecration were being practiced at the same time, by the same people but for different purposes. The Nephites continued to obey the principles of united order for a considerable time, and they had all things common among them, therefore, they're not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were made free, and partakers of the heavenly gift. 4 Nephi 3. Both tithing and united order were also combined in the revelations of the Lord to the Latter-day Saints. Although many Mormon people say that tithing is a lesser law, there is no scripture to substantiate that theory. Others say that it is a stepping stone to lead people into the united order and consecration, but if such were the case, then the Lord would have given tithing to the Mormons, before he gave them the law of consecration. However, it was the other way around. When the church was only a few months old, the Lord gave the saints the law of consecration, February 9, 1831, C.D. and C. 42. Shortly afterwards, the Lord gave further instructions for obeying this law of consecration in sections 51, 52, 56, 57, and 58. Seven months later, on September 11, 1831, c.c. 64 33, the Lord said that it was a day of the tithing of my people. This sounds as if the Lord may be giving up the principles of consecration. But two months later he told the saints more about this law of consecration. He said that their surplus must go to the storehouse, and that none are exempt from this law, who belong to the Church of the Living God, d and c 70 10. He continued to add more instructions on the law of consecration in sections 78, 82, 84, 85, and 88. Right bracket later, on August 2, 1833, the Lord again calls for the saints to build a house by the tithing of my people. D&C 97 11, a year after this tithing law, the Lord continued to reveal more on the law of consecration, saying that it is for the benefit of my church, and for the salvation of men, until I come. D&C 104 1, three months after this revelation on consecration, the Lord gave a revelation on tithing which was for my holy priesthood. D&C 
DNC 119 4, three years after this tithing revelation in section 119, the Lord called George Miller to be a bishop like Edward Partridge to receive the consecrations of mine house. DNC 124 21. Doesn't this seem inconsistent? Can anyone determine where consecration was repealed and tithing was substituted? If anyone thinks that consecration was done away and tithing was left as the law for the church, how does he explain why the Lord gave a revelation nearly ten years after the last law of tithing, which called for Brian Young to organize the saints into companies that would bear an equal proportion, according to the dividend of their property? DNC 136:8. Essentially, we must conclude that consecration was the first and the last economic law given the church. But that does not explain how tithing can be a law that would continue until the Lord would come. To make this all a little more confusing, it is interesting to note the Lord sometimes mentioned tithing and consecration in the same paragraph, or even in the same sentence. Once he said, I require all the surplus property to be put into the hands of the bishop, and this shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. DNC 119 1,3. Right bracket on another occasion the Lord said that the saints should receive their inheritance by consecration, agreeable to his law, which he has given, that he may tithe his people. DNC 85 3. Again, on July 8, 1838, a public meeting was held to discuss the law of consecration and stewardship when a revelation was given that pertained to tithing. CDHC 344. The reason why tithing and consecration were often mentioned together is because they are meant to function together. Simply said, tithing belongs to the law of consecration, and consecration is not complete without the law of tithing. The Lord said that consecration is an everlasting order, d and 104 1, and that tithing is a standing law unto them forever, d and c 119 4. It may seem contradictory that both the united order and tithing can exist at the same time and among the same people. And it may seem impossible consecration and tithing can both be everlasting laws of the gospel. The question then arises as to how these two important principles of the gospel can function at the same time. Consider the following revelation on how these two laws can function when they are obeyed properly. Verily, thus saith the Lord, I require their surplus property to be put into the hands of the bishop of my church in Zion. Star asterisk asterisk, and this consecration shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. And after that, those who have thus been tithed shall pay one tenth of all their interest annually, and this shall be a standing law unto them forever, for my holy priesthood, saith the Lord. DNC 119 1,3,4. It is clear that the law of tithing was to take effect after the consecrations had been made. After the increase had been given to the storehouse of the Lord, then a tithe was taken. A man living the United Order was commanded to put all his surplus into the bishop's storehouse. Nowhere does it say that he must pay his tithing first. After it is in the storehouse, then it is the duty of the bishop to draw a tithing out and present it to church headquarters. The church then has the duty to pay, to purchase or to contribute the Lord's tithing for those things which the Lord has designated. Consider the problem for church headquarters if everyone in the church lived the united order and tithing was done away. Where would the church receive funds to operate or to do all the things which the Lord has designated? The Lord's tithing is for him to spend in the way that he has designated. The Lord indicates that tithing provides for the poor, church headquarters, the publication of books and pamphlets, the missionary system, temples, church buildings and other things which he may designate. The united order is for the benefit of the saints, but the tithing belongs to the Lord. It was on the principle of tithing coordinated with the principle of the united order that would open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Mal. 310, the right bracket tithing system that we have in the church today could never open any of the windows of heaven, the reason being that a rich man who pays tithing might be living next door to a poor widow who is also paying tithing and that inequality is an evil which the Lord cannot condone. That is an unjust and unfair system which is not according to the Lord's law of tithing. Today in the church the rich are getting richer the poor are getting poorer. The Lord is not satisfied with that kind of condition among his people, even if they are individually paying tithing. The Lord said that it is not given that one man should possess that which is above another. D&C 38,27, but under our present system of economies and tithing, all men are unequal in their possessions, and therefore unapproved by the Lord. 
only when men live the united order and then collectively pay a tithe of their surplus to the Lord can the windows of heaven be opened. There is another objection for individual payment of tithing even in united order. Let us consider a ward, stake or a whole community living the highest form of the united order after the family system. We learn that some men are devoting all of their time and talents to spiritual things, just as the Levites did. The Lord said, He who is appointed to administer spiritual things, the same is worthy of his hire, even as those who are appointed to a stewardship to administer in temporal things. Nevertheless, in your temporal things you shall be equal, and this not grudgingly. D and C 70 colon 12, 14. Right bracket If a man is devoting all of his time to the spiritual things, then he has nothing to pay 10% from. Even a bishop might be devoting all of his time to the functioning of the order, not realizing any temporal profits for his labor. A teacher, a missionary, etc., all might be laboring in the order and never see any money for their work, and it would be impossible for them to pay a tithing. In fact, there may be only a very few men in the order who would be handling money, doing the merchandising and buying or selling for the whole order. It would certainly not be their responsibility to pay the tithing. Orson Pratt explained. If they are equally faithful, they are equally beloved of the Lord, and they are equally entitled to food and raiment, and to the good things of the earth. And the bishop has no more claim upon the Lord's storehouse than the least member of the church, only as his time may be more occupied in public matters, which may prevent him from cultivating the earth or engaging in other business avocations. And the same is true in regard to the twelve, or the first presidency. The highest officers and the lowest are all one in Christ children of the same great family. The seer O. Pratt, page 293. A properly organized united order might function for many years, with most of the members never handling money. Yet, if the bishop were paying to church headquarters a tithe from the surplus of the order, then all the members would be full tithe payers, and yet equally faithful to the law of consecration. This is the Lord's law of tithing and right bracket united order. No other system is acceptable to him. A tithing from the surplus would make them all obedient in the law of consecration and tithing, and equal as he has commanded. It would be foolish to think that we must continue to keep living by the Gentile money system that we can individually pay tithing. United order is a law of heaven, and it is ridiculous to assume that greenbacks have any place inside the pearly gates. Tithing is a fair law only when it is drawn proportionately from the surplus of the order or community. A true united order lives like a family with only a few at the head that control the buying and selling. Several of the family orders in early church history paid their tithing from the surplus at the end of the year, according to the law of the Lord. In Audible, Utah, it was part of the law that 10% of the net increase of the order was paid to the church each year for tithing. Building the City of God, Arrington, Fox and May, p. 276, there were several good reasons for this, and one was that the church received tithing from the order, and hence was in a strategic position to maintain control of the order. Mormon United Order in Utah, by Angus Woodbury, page 13, this assured the church that it was receiving a full tithing from its members something that has never been achieved under the present system of tithing. It is difficult to point to a time when the church was obedient to the law of United Order and tithing as the Lord commanded. Rhyme Young knew this and said, I sometimes think that I would be willing to give anything, to do almost anything in reason, to see one fully organized branch of this kingdom one fully organized ward. Asterisk 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 is there even in this territory a fully organized ward? Not one. It may be asked, why do you not fully organize the church? Because the people are incapable of being organized. I could organize a large ward who would be subject to a full organization by selecting families from the different wards, but at present such a branch of the church is not in existence. JD 1020 our tithing system in the church today is in many respects less equitable, and certainly less fair, than the Gentile system of income tax. This tithing system takes the same percentage from everyone, which is easy for the rich, but a burden on the poor. But the income tax takes most from the rich, and nothing from the poor and in some instances the wealth taken from the rich is given to the poor. The income tax is an unconstitutional and an abominable program, because it is enforced upon people, but, nevertheless, it is more fair and just than our individual tithing system. There are several faults to this present tithing system, as noted by some students of Mormonism. For example, in regard to the financial affairs of the Mormon Church, three criticisms are now common. 
1. That the tithing system is inequitable, 2. That the revenues of the church are controlled by a few of its leaders, 3. That the pecuniary interests rather than the social welfare of the people right bracket have become the controlling factor in the distribution of its income. United Order Among the Mormons, Joseph Jeddus, page 66. Specific purposes for tithing were revealed by Lord when he said, dot, 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 to administer to the poor and the needy, as shall be appointed by the high council of the church, and the bishop and his council, and for the purpose of purchasing lands for the public benefit of the church, and building houses of worship, and building up of the new Jerusalem which is hereafter to be revealed that my covenant people may be gathered in one in that day, when I shall come to my temple, and this I do for the salvation of my people. D and C 42 colon 34 to 36. From this we learn that there are at least six important areas for which tithing from the United Order storehouse was to be used. 1. Administering to the poor and needy. 2. Purchasing more land. 3. Building houses of worship. 4. Building the new Jerusalem. 5. Gathering Israel. 6. Promoting the temporal and spiritual salvation of the saints. When the saints seek to accomplish these things with the tithing funds, then the Lord will bless them, but when they do not, he will curse them. He said, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Mal. 3 8 9. Too often the tithing from churches, groups or religious organizations, is used by a few for investments in business enterprises, which in turn pays dividends or creates lucrative positions for church leaders, rather than for the tither payers. Often tithing is used by a few for their private expenses or personal use, without the consent, and often without even the knowledge, of the tither payer. This is priestcraft, and the Lord has dash. Dash commanded that there shall be no priestcrafts, for, behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. 2 Nephi 26 29. The Nephites had trouble with priestcraft even after the death of Neha, the major advocate of it. Nevertheless, this did not put an end to the spreading of priestcraft through the land, for there were many who loved the vain things of the world, and they went forth preaching false doctrines, and this they did for the sake of riches and honor. Alma 1 16. It has persisted and is still prevalent in the land today. Therefore, money taken for tithing but got used as prescribed by the Lord, is priestcraft. For tithing is the Lord's. Right bracket united order was not to be done away by the law of tithing, neither is tithing to be abandoned when this people live the united order. Neither has the law of consecration been done away, it is still binding upon the latter-day saints. Everyone going through the temple makes an oath and covenant to obey that law. Although the whole temple ceremony has been published many times, it is not understood by Mormon or anti-Mormon. Consider the covenant taken. Each of you bring your right arm to the square. You and each of you do covenant and promise before God, angels and these witnesses at this altar, that you will keep the law of consecration as contained in this the book of doctrine and covenants, which is that you do consecrate yourselves, your time, talents and everything with which the Lord has blessed you, or with which he may bless you. To the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the building up of the kingdom of God on the earth, and for the establishment of Zion. This is another way of saying that we will love God with all our might, mind and strength. If the Lord had done away with the law of consecration, then why did he continue making the saints' covenant to obey it? Or, why do the saints go through the temple and take this oath and covenant to obey the law of consecration, and then come out thinking that consecration was done away? When men make this commitment to consecrate yourselves right bracket, your time, talents, and everything to the Lord, then they should make every attempt to do so either collectively or individually, so that covenant is not broken. If they don't, the windows of heaven will continue to remain closed to them. Right bracket organizational chart. For tithing and united order.